from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's editorial director. I hope everyone had a good holiday season and a happy new year. In today's podcast, we'll be taking a look at the year ahead and talking to a number of different scholars from across MEI about what to watch for in 2019. We'll kick things off with Paul Salem, MEI's president, to discuss the macro view of the region, focusing on the conflicts, events, and key policy decisions that are likely to shape the Middle East this year. Paul, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you, Alistair, and greetings to all our listeners. Where do things stand in the Middle East in early 2019? Can you give us the big picture view? Where do they stand? Well, (laughs) it's not standing up very much. It's just a lot of sort of disintegration, a lot of conflict uh, conflict areas and so on. Well, let's sort of zero in on the four civil wars, which are particularly painful. Uh, the war in Yemen uh, de-escalated a bit at the end of 2018. Uh, there's promise of more talks to keep it de-escalated. Uh, I think all parties are aware of the need to de-escalate that. I don't think uh, the Yemen conflict will find a final resolution in 2019, but the humanitarian suffering could be made less, hopefully. Uh, in Libya as well, there is a, you know, glimmers of de-escalation, further talks, uh, and probably not a very terrible situation in 2019, and maybe some hope of resolution, uh, even if it's sort of unstable and shaky. Uh, this contrasts very much with the situation in Afghanistan, which is bad and likely to get worse. Uh, It's already very bad. And after the winter, the spring season is likely to see another round of fighting. Um, And the U.S., at least President Trump's announcement that he wanted to draw down forces there will uh, certainly embolden the Taliban in the spring and might make uh, any de-escalation or negotiations much harder to achieve. So Afghanistan is likely to have a very difficult year. Uh, In Syria, uh, uh, there are things going in different directions. On the one hand, uh, part of the civil war has ended in favor of the regime and its Iranian and Russian allies, uh, but that leaves large areas of the country, particularly the northwest under Turkish control, the northeast so far under American and Kurdish control, but uh, as we know, President Trump over the holidays announced that he wanted U.S. troops out, and his national security advisor seems to be saying the opposite, that no, they're not going out. Major question marks there, for sure. So uh, depending on where the U.S. ends up there, although it's tending towards departure, uh, the question of what will happen to the Kurds, uh, will the Turks attack there, will they make a deal with the regime? So the Northeast is very much in play. Will the Americans stay in the southeast? Yet another issue. Um, And what will happen to the area of Idlib? So in some areas, uh, the Assad regime is winning, stabilizing. It's very significant that uh, the Arab countries are moving towards normalizing relations with the regime. Uh, The UAE opened an embassy and others already have relations and some will open relations again. The Arab League probably will readmit them. Um, we admit the Syrian government, and if that happens, the Arab League might issue a call to the world community, and that'll put the Europeans and the Americans you know, in a bind if the Arabs are saying this. So that could be a big question mark, but there is still much uh, outside of the regime's control uh, that is uncertain. Uh, uh, so, yeah, those are kind of the civil war cases. Outside of the civil wars, what are the other kind of key issues or, or events that you'll be watching this year? The three big ones, I guess, one is obviously the, you know, sanctions against Iran, uh, which will remain in place throughout uh, uh, 2019. The Iranians are not going to negotiate, but the Iranian economy will suffer. What will happen inside Iran? How will that impact, you know, Iranian politics? All of that is, is, is important and interesting to watch. There's a lot of discontent inside Iran. Uh, also, uh, probably the highest risk access is the Iranian-Israeli one, uh, which almost came to full you know, blows in 2018 and is still a very hot front. This is uh, across Israeli-Syrian lines where Iran is present or Israeli-Lebanese lines where Hezbollah is present. Hezbollah is present in both. So that could be the one big military flashpoint that could define 2019. 
I would still say it's unlikely to erupt fully, but it's certainly something to watch very closely. Uh, the other uh, conflict axis, less dramatic, but is within the GCC and includes, you know, on the one hand, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, and Bahrain, and on the other, effectively, Qatar and Turkey. Uh, that affects Turkish-Egyptian relations, the two biggest Sunni countries in the Middle East, and of course it affects GCC relations. Uh, unlikely to come to blows or anything terribly dramatic, but will cast a shadow on sort of developments in the region. The, the longest standing one, uh, obviously, is the Israel-Palestine uh, uh, conflict or track. On the one hand, most of the Arab states, many of them have, are, you know, have behind the scenes relations with Israel, but no major peace breakthrough is possible until there's a deal with the Palestinians, and that still seems to be. I mean, despite repeated Trump promises that there is going to be a deal of the century, that seems unlikely to happen. Maybe uh, next century. Maybe the next one. Um, and Prime Minister Netanyahu facing corruption investigations and a general election, the Palestinian politics and all kinds of disarray, uh, huge discontent among Palestinians in Gaza in particular. So, you know, things could happen uh, certainly in that uh, arena. I would say those are some of the, you know, the arenas to look for. Lastly, I wanted to ask you about the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. We are looking ahead in a few weeks' time to the, the beginning of, of year three of the Trump administration. Where do things stand in regard to U.S. policy towards the Middle East, and what are your expectations for 2019, particularly on the back of President Trump's uh, announcement at the end of the year that the U.S. would be withdrawing troops from, from Syria? Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, uh, the Trump administration is a, a moving Organism, it changes. Uh, General Mattis was Secretary of Defense. He was is no longer Tillerson when replaced by Pompeo. John Bolton's third National Security Advisor. Will he survive the next few months or year? Will Secretary Pompeo be in place? Who will be the next uh, Secretary of Defense? So the administration keeps changing to start with. And then President Trump keeps changing his mind on key issues, sometimes in the same day, sometimes in the same week. I think it's quite clear that Trump's you know, Trump is tending more towards his core of sort of being more isolationist, just wanting to get sort of the hell out of the area, and his advisors slow peddling that. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's safe to say that the U.S. is leaving Syria in 2019, probably reducing its presence in Afghanistan somewhat uh, in 2019 as well, uh, might a little bit reduce its footprint in Iraq as well. Um, I think those things will happen. I expect no progress on the Israel-Palestine front uh, from the U.S. side, uh, no, nothing dramatic. One thing to watch might be oil prices uh, because Saudi Arabia needs them to be higher and Trump, as he's moving towards elections, wants them to be lower. Uh, the economy is one of his Achilles heels, obviously running up to the 2020 election stock market already in disarray. And the economy, while hot now, might cool in late 2019 and 2020. And oil might be a big uh, big part of that. And that might impact his approach to Saudi Arabia uh, and countries of that nature. But uh, I think what's also clear is that U.S. has eclipsed itself as a reliable global player in the Middle East. It's hard for anybody in the Middle East to take the U.S. seriously under this administration, uh, partly because it's uh, isolationist, but more more that it's unreliable. You don't know who it's speaks for the administration. Issue, yeah. yeah. And if and, and even if you speak with the president, you know, the next day he could take it. So so that's a great boon, obviously, to Iran, to China, to Russia, to other players. Uh, and also maybe on the, on a healthy note, it forces the countries of the region maybe to rely on themselves and to talk and deal with each other rather than always rely on the U.S. So maybe maybe there is a silver lining. We'll have to leave it there. Paul, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Alistair. I'm delighted to welcome Charles Lister to the podcast next to discuss Syria and counterterrorism. Charles is a senior fellow at MEI and the director of the Countering Terrorism and Extremism Program. Thank you for joining me today, Charles. Great to be here. I'd like to start with the conflict in Syria. Where do things stand nearly eight years on? Well, the conflict changed hugely in 2018. Uh, I think for a whole variety of reasons, we saw the regime in Damascus, backed by Russia and Iran, assume and consolidate control over a significant amount of territory. And I think at this point in time in early 2019, it's safe to say that the regime has secured its survival. 
Uh, I would debate whether or not to use the term victory, um, but but they have secured their survival. I think that's irreversible now. The conflict between the opposition and the regime is virtually over, um, with the last major um, point of contact being Idlib, um, which is an area that continues to be um, in flux uh, and particularly dynamic right now uh, in, in early January. Um, uh, as as various extremist groups are essentially taking over with with little to no opposition from from other groups, so that the fate of Idlib will be a big question, I think, in the coming months. There's huge consequences if if conflict there really does erupt. Um, if there's if that zone of territory does fall under extremist control, I think that Damascus and Russia will be uh, almost certain to attack at some point. That that they will see that as a as a situation that is unacceptable. Um, and then, of course, we've got the big questions over um, the status of the U.S. presence with our various allies in the Northeast. What's going to happen to that 20, 30 percent of territory? Who will that fall under if and when the U.S. does leave? Um, which are all, I think, open questions at this point, a lot to be figured out. I wanted to ask specifically about that. Where does the kind of U.S. policy stand at the moment and and what, in your view, would be the impact if, if the U.S. does agree to, to pull out its troops? Sure. Well, I mean, it's a key question. I, we live in a, a difficult time because it's it's tricky at the moment to figure out what U.S. policy actually means and who makes U.S. policy. So for a whole period of time in the second half of 2018, there were various appointments in the State Department and a big new kind of newly assertive Syria strategy was presented. Uh, I was told right from the top level um, that this had the president's approval. And then all of a sudden, lo and behold, just before Christmas, President Trump said, we're leaving. I've always said we were going to leave. And, you know, the, all of the other issues that were there are either complete or can be dealt with by others, which is exactly not what we were told in the months before that. Now, my assumption is, having met with a variety of senior officials who work this file, uh, we are leaving. There is an open question as to exactly how quickly. Um, originally, the president gave a 30-day deadline to withdraw. That's now been extended to four months. There's a possibility that may be extended a little further. Um, but the open question, I think, is the details. So we've got John Bolton traveling in the region right now essentially saying different things to the president. Um, we've got Jim Jeffrey as the special envoy for Syria engagement and his team also traveling in the region, also saying different things to the president. So do we assume that pr the president's line is that we are leaving full stop? Or do we assume that this could become somewhat more of an open ended withdrawal? Withdrawal could mean we continue to have covert special operation forces on the ground that nobody secretly knows about? Um, does it mean that we still have an air campaign from Iraq and elsewhere in the region? These are all open questions that I, I actually don't think they've been figured out. My understanding is the withdrawal order has been given and accepted, but that's it. It seems like How the policy we, debate is playing out in public in yeah, a way that yeah. it doesn't normally. Exactly. I mean, I think I think a lot of I, th I think a lot of Trump appointees will say publicly, "Well, this was always expected. We always knew the president would want us to leave." But at the same time, I still think it came as a shock, and the abruptness with which it came came as a shock, which is why essentially DOD and the State Department are kind of in crisis mode right now, twenty four seven planning mode about exactly how this works out, and most importantly. You know, who takes control of the territories um, currently held by our partners on the ground, the Syrian Democratic Forces? Is it is it Turkey through some kind of awkward arrangement or detente? Is it the regime um, with or without our knowledge? Is it the Russians through some kind of big international deal? None of that has been worked out. That's the big question mark looming over all of this is the details of what withdrawal means. The other big development at the end of 2018 was the announcement by the UAE that it reopened its embassy in Damascus. Are we likely to see the Arab League and its suspension of Syria's membership? And will more broadly 2019 be the year in which uh, countries normalize their diplomatic ties? I think certainly in the region, yes. I think that path was laid earlier, earlier in 2018, um, although in secret. Um, the UAE had been holding reconstruction conferences in, in, in on Emirati territory for, for some time last year. So I think the Emirati move will be the kind of the test case. Um, I've heard reports uh, or rumors at least that uh, that Lebanon may have already invited Syria to join the next uh, Arab League meeting uh, uh, this year for a whole variety of reasons, I assume. 
Um, and, but I think the path has been laid. I think really what we're seeing in terms of the Emirati position here, I think the Saudis are similar, but perhaps a few steps behind um, the UAE. Um, Bahrain has already you know, made similar moves. The Lebanese, I think, can be assumed to be making similar moves. Um, I think all of this is more of a reflection of regional dynamics than it is Syria. So the Emiratis are taking a, 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 an assumption that by re-engaging with Assad, we can pull Assad away from Iran, we can weaken Turkey and the Qataris, who may try to second step that same move or establish their own areas of influence in Syria. Uh, so I think actually in some ways, you know, the resignation of, of Tony Zinni from the GCC envoy position uh, as a sign of, you know, there's just no hope for the GCC coming back together again, which was basically what he said, I think is reflected in some of these other moves is actually this has, sadly, less to do with Syria and Syrians than it does with broader re, a broader regional resorting or consolidation of a status quo. Switching gears to counterterrorism, what is the state of play in the campaign against ISIS and exactly how premature was President Trump's declaration of victory? Well, this is, I guess, an open question, an open debate within the counterterrorism community is can you ever declare victory at all? Um, if you want to declare a military victory, then it was somewhat premature. We are still fighting on the ground. Two British uh, soldiers were literally just wounded a few days ago um, in, a, in an open battle with ISIS in Syria. ISIS still controls this small pocket of territory in Syria in the open. We're still fighting for that territory. So we haven't won. We haven't won yet. Um, that pocket still remains in ISIS control. Um, and also, if we want to be really honest, back in August last year, the DOD and the DIA released an assessment, which was later declassified, that suggested at least that their assessment was ISIS still had 30 to 32,000 fighters in Iraq and Syria combined, roughly split 50-50 between the two countries. We haven't killed 32,000 ISIS fighters in the last four or five months, so therefore the assumption is that they're still very much a fighting force, but a different one. They don't control territory in the open. They're fighting under the surface, and they've gone back to guerrilla warfare, which is actually more the norm for them and their predecessors than an open governing uh, actor. So, yes, it's a premature. It's a very much a premature statement to make. I would argue it's a dangerous decision to have made. Um, if we want to look back, um, one of Donald Trump's biggest foreign policy positions in his presidential campaign was that, quote, Obama created ISIS by leaving Iraq too early. Well, frankly speaking, I think Donald Trump is uh, wanting to leave Syria even earlier than Barack Obama wanted to leave Iraq. Uh, and so there are already officials in government, frankly, who say behind the scenes, we'll be back in a couple of years. There is no way that ISIS is going to suffer a deadly blow in the next two, three, four months and never be able to come back again. If anything, the conditions in Syria will be more amenable to an ISIS recovery than they were in Iraq in 2010, 2011. So it's a very unfortunate reaction, I think largely driven by domestic politics and not by a foreign policy. We'll have to leave it there. Thanks again for joining us on the program today, Charles. Great. Thanks for having me. I'm very happy to welcome Ahmed Majidyar to the podcast to talk about Afghanistan and Iran. Ahmed is a senior fellow here at MEI and the director of our Iran Observe project. Thank you for joining us. Great to be with you this morning. I'd like to begin with Afghanistan. Where do things stand? What is the security situation like? And what's the status of talks with the Taliban? 2019 will be a very challenging year for Afghanistan. And security will be the biggest challenge because the Taliban have gained momentum on the battlefield. And also they continue to refuse to have direct dialogue with the Afghan government to negotiate peace. On the other hand, the uh, uh, civilian casualties and also the casualties of the Afghan security forces have reached record levels. And uh, next year, the Taliban have said that they will uh, launch another spring offensive and step up violence. Um, and on the other hand, we also see that the Trump administration is uh, considering uh, significantly reducing the number of uh, American troops in Afghanistan, or even perhaps pulling out all American uh, troops from the country, which I think will be a recipe for disaster, uh, the, same, the same way that the precipitous withdrawal from Iraq led to the rise of ISIS. One of the major events this year is the upcoming presidential elections. Uh, the timeline for them has already slipped from April to at least July. Are you concerned that that could, uh, could, could slip further in the year ahead? 
Yeah, actually, it is not certain that the government will be able to conduct critical elections even in July, because in July, that will be the peak of the Taliban summer offensive. So security will be a big challenge. But on the other hand, political instability could also undermine holding a very credible elections because uh, the longer the elections uh, uh, is dragged on, uh, there could be a constitutional uh, crisis which will uh, uh, call into question the legitimacy of the current government. How is the economy faring and what are the prospects for 2019? I think there will be significant challenges for the Afghan economy as international assistance is shrinking and also security discourages both domestic and also international companies from investing in Afghanistan. And on the other hand, we see as there are economic problems because of the US sanctions in Iran and also Afghanistan and Pakistan relations are deteriorating, uh, an increasing number of Afghan refugees are returning, which could add to the economic pressure in the country. You touched on it previously, but I wanted to ask in a little bit more detail about President Trump's announcement about U.S. troops in uh, in late December of 2018. In your view, what would be the impact if the administration does decide to significantly reduce troop numbers or, in fact, end the mission in Afghanistan entirely? First of all, I think that the timing of uh, any withdrawal this time will be wrong uh, because the Trump administration has tipped up diplomacy with the Taliban in order to find a political settlement. So that you are uh, taking away the biggest leverage that the United States and its allies has with the Taliban in terms of just any uh, political deal. And on the other hand, that also sends a very wrong message both to friends and enemies in Afghanistan that the United States is abandoning uh, the Afghans once again. And also the regional countries, uh, if they think that the United States is leaving, and that could lead to potential chaos and instability in the country, then they might just step up uh, their support for different proxy groups, which will at the expense of Afghanistan's stability. I'd like to quickly move over to Iran as well. What's your outlook for 2019, and which issues will you be paying particularly close attention to this year? I think that uh, we we would see more uh, confrontation rather than cooperation between Tehran and Washington. And the Trump administration will continue to increase uh, both diplomatic uh, and uh, perhaps even military pressure uh, on Iran in order to, on the one hand, force Iran to come to the negotiating table to uh, strike a new deal that could address not only Iran's uh, nuclear activities, but also controversial ballistic missile program and also Iran's what the administration calls malign activities in the region. And on the other hand, the United States will work with its regional allies uh, in order to uh, uh, diminish Iran's growing influence in the region. So we might see more tension between the two countries, particularly at the time that uh, we uh, we see the collapse of the Islamic State, which was a common enemy to both of them. Uh, The two countries were de facto allies in Iraq. But now with common enemies gone, we could see more tension in the region as well. On the domestic level within Iran, uh, given that the economy faces U.S. sanctions, oil prices are low, and there are a host of other kind of unresolved structural issues, how much of a chance is there that that things will pick up this year? I think that the Iranian economy uh, might worsen uh, this year. Uh, That's partly because of the U.S. sanctions. Uh, We don't know yet that if the administration, the Trump administration, will continue these uh, uh, waivers for, for the a sale of Iranian oil uh, to other countries. But if uh, the Trump administration forces, particularly countries like China and India, which are the largest importers of Iranian oil, to bring their imports to zero, that will have significant impact on the Iranian economy. But as far as the Iranian uh, population is concerned, we see in the recent protests that they are not blaming the U.S. sanctions for Uh, the very bad condition of the Iranian economy, but they are blaming uh, their leaders, uh, both civilian and military leaders, and even uh, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei uh, for mismanagement and corruption. Uh, So they believe that rather than U.S. sanctions, it is mismanagement and corruption, and also Iran's uh, exorbitant amount of money that they are spending in regional countries, in wars, and also in support of state and non-state actors. So we might see these protests... uh, uh, perhaps spreading in the country, even in a, uh, even though perhaps in a sporadic way. Just curious, how has President Trump's announcement about the the potential withdrawal of troops from Syria and Afghanistan been perceived in in Tehran? Tehran has been largely mute about uh, President Trump's uh, decision to uh, withdraw troops from Syria. 
Uh, there, of course, that's in their advantage uh, because after that, the uh, Assad regime, which is closest ally of Iran, has uh, maintained again, regained control over the population center, and now his future uh, looks pretty good right now, uh, or uh, he's at least in control right now. Uh, Iranian leaders were seeing the presence of U.S. troops as the biggest threat, both to the survival of the Assad regime in future and also to their strategic interests and long-term military presence in the region. So now that the U.S. has uh, decided to leave uh, Syria, that's a relief for Iran, but they don't want to say that publicly uh, so as not to just challenge President Trump. Great. We're going to leave it there. Thank you for joining us on the podcast today, Ahmed. It was great talking to you. Next on the program, we'll be joined by Ramda Slim to discuss Iraq. Ramda is a senior fellow and director of MEI's Conflict Resolution and Track 2 Dialogue Program. Thank you for joining us, Ramda, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good to be with you. What does the year ahead look like for Iraq, and what are the key challenges facing the country? Well, I mean, it is, it's, a mixed, it's a mixed story, I think, uh, going ahead for Iraq. On one hand, you have a country that has vanquished or uh, where... Uh, most of ISIS held territory has been liberated, up to 98%. So in that respect, there is a positive note, you know, to end the year with and to start the new year with. But on the other hand, you have also a country where you have still ISIS sleeper cells, and uh, they are starting to make their comeback uh, in the central north and west of the country. And so that remains a challenge for the country. I think you have a challenge of governance, which is a major challenge facing the government of Iraq, the prime minister of Iraq, uh, providing basic services, potable water, electricity, adequate health care, uh, adequate education systems, uh, jobs, employment. I think that remains a major challenge for Iraq. The third challenge is the relationship between the KRG, the Kurdistan regional government, and Baghdad, a Kurdish referendum. Has, was done in September 2017. Then you had a number of uh, moves by the Iraqi government in uh, Baghdad, uh, loss of the territories that uh, KRG used to control. Uh, the government of Baghdad took over it, many of these disputed territories. This relationship needs to be put back into its right space or on, on the right track. And I think that's going to be a challenge for uh, for uh, the government, and I expect the new president, Barham Saleh, uh, to play a big role in putting this relationship back on its right track. And I think also there is a challenge of stabilization of all the territories liberated from ISIS. Uh, you have until now about 1.8 million Iraqis that are still internally displaced. Uh, about 500,000 of them live over, you know, 127 camps. Uh, um, they are not returning homes. Uh, so long-term displacement is usually sets in a dynamic that's very hard to reverse because people start to develop lives and community and, rela and relationship in new communities where they reside. So, um, and that's going to be um, difficult, you know, to stabilize these areas uh, um, and for IDPs to return to, to, to these stabilized, uh, to, to these areas. And finally, and most importantly, what we are seeing is uh, growing separation or the growing uh, gaps between uh, the citizens and their governments. Uh, we have seen example of that in last summer with the Basra riots, uh, uh, in the elections and the outcome. The outcome of the election revealed very much a fragmentation of the old ethno-sectarian blocs that used to be part of the Iraqi political landscape and uh, that has given rise on one hand to new faces that entered the parliament. Two-thirds of the parliaments are new faces. Uh, but on the other hand, it has created a challenge to translate uh, these uh, changes that were um, you know, produced by uh, the elections to translate the desire of people to have more voices and uh, into the political system into structural changes in a system where uh, traditional political parties, political elites uh, that have been ruling Iraq since 2003 are still more important, have more of sway than state institutions. You just touched on it now, but the May 2018 elections obviously brought about a significant change in, in the parliament, a uh, new, new prime minister, a new president. The cabinet is still in the process of, of being finalized at this point, but what's your take on the prospects for Prime Minister Abdul, Abdul Mahdi's government? 
Again, there are three portfolios which are at the heart of the problem here, which is uh, defense, interior, and justice. And uh, the last time that the Iraqi parliament or the head of the Iraqi parliament tried to put uh, for a vote uh, the candidacy of Falah al-Fayyad for minister of uh, interior, uh, the members of the Sadr bloc, uh, of the reform uh, coalition left and basically you know left the parliament building and there was no quorum as a result and they have been doing this and this over and over and and the message has been you know sent to the prime minister Adil Abdel Mahdi over numerous equations by by uh, by uh, cleric Muqtada Sadr that they are not going to be accepting this candidacy for Falih uh, al candidacy for Minister of Justice. So I think the question is going to be that as long as, I mean, on one hand, Abdel Abdel Mahdi, um, uh, you know, came, uh, bro- uh, broke, broke the monopoly which uh, a dawah has had over the position of prime minister and the office of the prime minister since 2005. And so he doesn't come from dawah, and so he's a technocrat. Uh, he came with a technocratic agenda. But at the same time, the fact that he doesn't have a strong coalition backing him, that makes his rule very much, um, you know, at the... At the uh, at the behest at the, of, of the two major political parties right now that or the two major coalitions that today uh, rule in the parliament. Uh, on one hand, the coalition, the reform coalition led by Muqtada Sadr, and on the other hand, the construction, reconstruction, Al-Bina reconstruction coalition led by Hadil Amiri. And until there is an arrangement, a political arrangement between the heads of these two coalitions, I think uh, the pol- we are going to continue to face the same kind of deadlock and stalemate that we have seen until now with respect to these three portfolios of the cabinet. Finally, I just wanted to ask about relations with the U.S. as well. President Trump made a very brief three-hour visit uh, to Iraq uh, in late December on the 26th, but was only in country again for a couple of hours and didn't even meet with the prime minister. Is that, in a sense, a sort of metaphor for the current state of, of U.S.-Iraqi relations? And more importantly, he did not discuss much Iraq during those three hours. He was mostly focused on Syria. And I mean, let me say that this uh, trip did not endear him to the Iraqis uh, or to the Iraqi political class. Uh, I think uh, going forward, uh, you are going to... And and right after the trip, what we heard is increasing calls from some uh, uh, members in parliament, especially those that are pro-Iran and affiliated with um, Iran, uh, for calling on withdrawal of U.S. troops. I think you are going to continue to hear that. But at the same time, prime minister and other members of political elites of Iraq know that if they were to move with a vote on uh, removing U.S. forces from Iraq, President Trump will be more than happy to, you know, uh, go ahead and pull U.S. forces. I think what we're going to see going forward is two track process. So on one hand, you're going to see always continuously hearing from different quarters of the political spectrums calls for U.S. forces to remove. But on the other hand, uh, Prime Minister Adil Abdel Mahdi, ministers, uh, even members, some members of the coalition that is led by Amiri and definitely the coalition led by Sadr still understand that there needs to be U.S. forces uh, to provide uh, technical assistance to Iraqi forces, logistical training, operational training, uh, uh, special as long as ISIS sleeper cells remain to be a threat and there is a potential that if the economic conditions do not improve and if, the again, this problem with um, stabilization of territories liberated by ISIS uh, does not move forward, IDPs are not allowed to return home or cannot return home, there is a problem of ISIS, again, re-emerging and uh, reasserting itself uh, because what we see today with ISIS in terms of insurgency, insurgency in terms of its levels, numbers of fighters in terms of its attacks, its modus operandi, it's very much reminiscent of the its, its playbook that it used in 2012 to 2013, and then which eventually led to its takeover of Mosul in 2014. We're going to have to leave it there, but thank you very much for joining us today, Randa. Thank you very much. Next, we'll be moving on to Turkey. Joining me are Gunul Tol, the director of MEI's Turkey program, and Bob Pearson, a non-resident scholar at MEI, former U.S. ambassador to Turkey, and former director general of the U.S. Foreign Service. Happy New Year to you both, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank nice you. to be here. Gunul, let's start with you. What's in the cards for Turkey in 2019? 
I think domestically, uh, there are two important things to watch in Turkey in 2019. And that is the first one is the elections, upcoming elections in March, local elections. Um, and of course, the state of Turkish economy. Uh, and in terms of foreign policy, um, I think Turkey-U.S. relations, it, this will be an important test for Turkey-U.S. relations after a, a, a terrible year in 2018. Uh, and also Turkey's relations with Russia and uh, with the European Union, I think these are the things things to watch. You mentioned the March elections and the economic situation as two major issues to keep an eye out for this year. Uh, I'm curious about the connection between the two of them. To what extent do you think the economic conditions will affect the impact of the of the elections, and, and how do you think that'll play out? Well, historically, I think especially under under the ruling AKP, contrary to some arguments that that people in Turkey um, vote for the AKP for the the conservative agenda. Uh, identity issues matter, and yet I think economic considerations also historically have played an important role in uh, in the, the decision of, of the voters. In 2015, for instance, when there was the perception within Turkish society that Turkish economy was not doing well, that was when uh, the, the ruling AKP lost its parliamentary majority. So eco- economic considerations play an important role, and given the, uh, the troublesome year for the economy in 2018, and many economists are expecting an even worse year. Um, so that will certainly be a factor. But in the past, I should also note that that whenever um, there was economic troubles at home, President Erdogan managed to divert attention away from domestic problems, economic problems by focusing on foreign policy. Uh, and uh, the Turkey's, Turkish military's incursions in, into Syria, for instance, played an important role uh, in uh, his efforts to, to bolster his support at home. But that might be difficult this year, given the, the current context in Syria, given the U.S. Um, decision to withdraw troops and the complicated uh, context that's, that Turkey is facing in Syria. Bob, I wanted to ask you on uh, the point that you'll just refer to here, the announcement by President Trump about the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Syria. In light of that, what's your outlook for U.S.-Turkey relations in 2019? I think they're going to continue to be very uh, difficult, and I think they're going to get worse. I think that uh, Mr. Erdogan now believes that he has a slight upper hand. He has a promise from uh, Donald Trump that he is clearly going to come back and try to reaffirm uh, his uh, rejection of a meeting with John Bolton yesterday in uh, Turkey was the clearest proof that he'll be back in touch with the president very quickly on that. So he thinks uh, as well that he will be able to negotiate with the Russians uh, and the Syrians to deal with the Kurdish issue in northeastern Syria. I, I think he is too optimistic about what he can do. His editorial, I think, in the New York Times implies that he can somehow separate the Kurdish people from the Kurdish fighters. I don't think that's credible. Uh, And he also asserts that they can handle ISIS when, in fact, Turkey's done very little militarily to deal with ISIS. We certainly are thankful for their generosity towards the Kurdish refugees. But he probably knows that Donald Trump didn't know that the ISIS concentration is hundreds of miles south of the Turkish border. So uh, I think that we will look now for a role from the U.S. Congress, already looking to uh, increase sanctions against Assad, to commit the U.S. to some form of protection for the Kurds, uh, to greater suspicion about dealings with the Russians and the Iranians, concern about Israel playing into that. Uh, and so I think now that uh, Donald Trump has his own great challenges for 2019, but I think in general, Mr. Erdogan thinks he has the upper hand at this point. Well, just to return back to you, one of the points uh, that you referenced earlier and Bob just referenced as well uh, was the potential for greater Turkish-Russian cooperation. How do you see that playing out, particularly in the context of, of Syria this year? I think it might be more difficult uh, because if you look at the history of Turkey, Tur- Turkey-Russia cooperation in Syria, I think the American uh, presence in Syria played a huge role. 
in that. Uh, Russia green-lighted uh, the Turkish military operations in, in Syria, mainly uh, because of uh, Moscow's concerns over U.S. partnership with the Syrian Kurds and the U.S. presence there. So the Russian thinking was... Um, give the Turks a green light, and that would not only weaken the YPG and the YPG's cooperation with the U.S., but it would also drive a wedge between uh, Turkey and the United States. So that was the Russian thinking. And I think that was the reason why Russia and also Iran and the regime tolerated Turkey's, what Turkey was has been doing in North, northern Syria. And now if the U.S. is out of the picture... I mean, obviously, there's still a lot of confusion and the Russians have been uh, very careful. Uh, they're just watching. But I think if the Americans are, are not there anymore, I think Russians will be less inclined to tolerate uh, Turkish uh, military presence and, and operations in, in Syria. So I think that's why this could really test Turkey-Russia partnership. And... Um, but of course, Ankara for a long time uh, promoted the idea that a U.S. withdrawal would be great for Turkish interests in Syria. And in fact, I've always argued that it strengthened Turkey's hand vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So I think this year we will see whether the U.S. withdrawal, if that happens this year. Again, there are so many question marks, but if it happens, uh, I think it's uh, that, that will really test Turkey's assumption that it would serve Turkish interests in Syria. But we'll just have to wait and see. Gunil Bab, thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you. Next up on the podcast is Jerry Firestein, MEI's Senior Vice President, to discuss Yemen and the GCC. Thank you for joining me today, Jerry. Pleasure to be here. I wanted to start off by asking you about the conflict in Yemen, which has been going on for nearly four years now. There was a tentative agreement reached uh, at the Stockholm talks at the end of last year, but then that seemed to come undone. Where do things stand now, and how do you see the situation developing this year? Well, on the uh, on the ninth, uh, Martin Griffiths and the Undersecretary for Humanitarian Affairs, Mark Lowcock, uh, both appeared uh, at the Security Council to provide a, an update and a briefing on on the Yemen conflict, and unsurprisingly, both gave reasonably upbeat assessments of of what's happened. In particular, uh, Martin Griffiths noted that. Hodeida is showing some signs of progress. The level of violence is down. Uh, there are increasing uh, requests for uh, shipments into the port at Hodeida. Uh, they are continuing to work on the prisoner exchange agreement that was also part of the deal, as was uh, some progress on relieving the siege around the city of Taz. Um, so he um, thought that uh, perhaps they had seen some progress. Uh, he did note that uh, some areas uh, are not uh, making the, the same kind of progress. The level of violence in some of the districts around Hodeida continues to be high. Uh, there, um, uh, there is uh, not uh, much more to go on. And moreover, he made the, the point that uh, perhaps Stockholm was the low-hanging fruit and that the challenge that confronts them going forward is going to be more difficult. One of the things that people were uh, waiting to see is whether he was going to announce another round of uh, political negotiations. Uh, the expectation had been that a new round would be uh, in Amman, Jordan. Uh, he did not. He said that he was continuing to work on it. Uh, but he didn't make any announcements on that score. Uh, Lowcock, for his part, also uh, suggested that uh, there had been some forward progress on the humanitarian situation in Yemen, although he continued uh, to emphasize the dire nature of both the, uh, the food situation as well as the health uh, challenges in Yemen, uh, and uh, cast uh, castigated in particular um, the Houthis for their impediments uh, in taking uh, a lot of grain out of the Red Sea uh, mills. Uh, he said about uh, uh, grain for about three and a half million people is stuck uh, inside of the mills. A and also noted the recent letter from the World Food Program uh, complaining about the theft of uh, food assistance 
uh, from needy people in Sana'a and elsewhere in the north uh, by Houthi elements. So, uh, so again, uh, he noted that there had been some positive developments, some, some good things had been happening, uh, but still a, a huge challenge in front of uh, the international organizations and the international community to try to address this catastrophic situation. Switching gears to the Gulf, what does the year ahead look like for the GCC? Well, I think that for the GCC, probably the year ahead looks pretty much like the year behind. Uh, I don't think that we can expect that there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of uh, change in the situation as far as the GCC organization itself is concerned. Uh, while there had been some uh, uh, some hope that the Riyadh summit in December was going to provide an opening. Uh, for negotiations, discussions uh, towards resolving the ongoing conflict between Qatar, uh, the Saudis and Emiratis and Bahrainis. Uh, but that didn't happen. Sheikh Tamim, the Emir of Qatar, didn't attend. Uh, uh, the state of Qatar was represented at a lower level. Uh, and, uh, and neither party seemed to be uh, in the least bit interested in finding a way out of this conflict, which is now about 18 months old. So uh, the GCC as an organization continues to drift. Uh, I think that they will probably continue to work at a lower level on some uh, some non-controversial elements of cooperation, economic integration, coordination, uh, some other things. But the big issues of political security and military uh, integration or coordination are going to be left on the table which for the administration is uh, problematic because, of course, one of the big elements of the administration's uh, Gulf strategy has been the creation of what's called the Middle East Strategic Alliance, otherwise known as Arab NATO. Uh, We saw the envoy, the special envoy, for uh, this issue, both in terms of resolving the Qatar conflict, but also trying to advance uh, Mason negotiations, uh, uh, retired General Zinni uh, resigned uh, his position. He was, of course, uh, an appointee of uh, General Mattis, and so uh, that might have been a factor in his decision. But fundamentally, he uh, he told the president that he had been unable to achieve any progress on these issues uh, and therefore uh, would not continue. Uh, and in fact, I think it's unlikely that we're going to see any forward uh, momentum on those uh, on those areas. And so the, the likelihood is that we're going to see another year of drift uh, with the uh, ties uh, pulling the GCC states together, uh, gradually loosening, and each of the states uh, really looking to outside elements uh, to improve their relationships and, uh, and look beyond the GCC. How do you see U.S.-Saudi relations playing out in 2019? It's going to be a difficult year, I think, not only for U.S.-Saudi relations, but also for U.S.-Emirati relations. Uh, Of course, the uh, fallout, uh, both from the Yemen conflict as well as the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, continues to cast uh, a shadow over uh, the bilateral relationship with the Saudis. Uh, They are trying to uh, use, perhaps, the judicial process underway uh, as uh, as a way of moving beyond uh, the uh, the uh, frustration, the anger here in Washington over the uh, the murder of Khashoggi, uh, that is probably not going to be sufficient. I understand that uh, that there is uh, some thinking in Congress, particularly on the House of Representatives, uh, in uh, in uh, looking at legislation that would uh, that would raise. Uh, the cost to the Saudis uh, for their uh, for their shortcomings in both of these areas, uh, and uh, the other aspect I, I must say is that uh, with the uh, Democrats now in control of the House, uh, I think that we can probably expect that there's going to be closer examination of the roles that uh, the United Arab Emirates and the Saudis played in the uh, 2016 political campaigns as well as their relationships both with uh, President Trump and his family uh, and uh, other uh, other officials in the Trump administration uh, to look at whether or not uh, those relationships violated uh, various campaign laws uh, 
uh, or uh, or the emoluments uh, uh, aspects of uh, the U.S. Constitution. So I think that we're going to see uh, hearings. Uh, they may be contentious. They may be um, uh, difficult. Uh, and it is not going to be uh, an easy time for either the Saudis or the Emiratis. So a difficult time both within the GCC as well as in terms of his relationship with Washington this year. We'll have to leave it there, but thank you very much for joining us on the podcast today, Jay. Well, it's been a pleasure. And that's our podcast for today. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in and to my colleague Scott for producing the program today. See you all next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.